From King Solomon to the greatest African kings and lords, a straight-line comparison can be drawn. For their uncommon ability to lead and govern a nation, yes, for their immense wealth and riches, yes, their love for lavish parties and grandiose events, yes, that too. But one shared commonality between these great leaders is their love for the company of women. And no, we aren't just talking about their wives. That would be boring. We are talking about their shared love for concubines. Basically, a mistress or side chick that keeps the king entertained outside his marriage. These women were an essential aspect of the king's court. But in no other region in the world was the act of keeping concubines as important to the ruler as it was in ancient China. From one to potentially hundreds, there was no cap on the number of women the emperor could decide he wanted. Living with an emperor would undoubtedly mean that these women had to live shockingly different lives from what is and was considered normal. Join us today as we look at some shocking things that were normal for concubines in ancient China. They were under 24-7 surveillance. To live in the courtyard of an emperor would be the dream of many young women, as this would provide them unimaginable luxuries, opportunities, and a plethora of all other benefits. One of the things they would have to give up, however, would be their privacy. As a concubine of an ancient Chinese emperor, they were not allowed to communicate with just anyone. This was done to make sure that the concubine did not fall in love with any other person other than the emperor. And to ensure this was the case, a eunuch was tasked to follow each concubine wherever she went. There was no such thing as a casual stroll in the park alone anymore. They always had to be accompanied by their designated eunuch. And if a concubine was to defy the words of the emperor by not moving along with her eunuch, her punishment could range anywhere from banishment from the kingdom as a whole to execution. They could not leave the courtyard. A perfect segue from the last point. Once a woman was selected to be the concubine of an emperor, she was no longer allowed to leave the emperor's courtyard. Unless serving as an accomplice to the emperor when he embarks on a journey, a concubine was not allowed to leave the confines of the courtyard. Now, you may be asking, how about their original family? Can't the concubines leave to go see them? Well, sadly, no. On top of that, they were not allowed to receive visits from anyone either, even family members. To be a concubine for an ancient Chinese emperor, you essentially cut ties with everyone you've ever known and loved as you enter the emperor's courtyard. Any concubine caught receiving secret visits or trying to leave the courtyard without the consent of the emperor is sentenced to death. No girlfriends, only rivals. In such an environment with strict rules and regulations that each woman is to follow judiciously, you would think that a sense of camaraderie would be formed among the concubines in the courtyard. That since life in the courtyard is not so easy, each girl would have each girl's back and they were friends? Then you would be highly mistaken. In fact, it was the complete opposite. A standard courtyard could be filled with a large number of concubines, potentially reaching hundreds, each striving to get the emperor's attention to become his favorite and even rank higher in the concubine ranking. As such, each woman was always secretly plotting how to best the rest. From playing simple mind games to deceiving the emperor to kill a concubine, nothing was off the table as long as it meant they would get closer to the emperor and earn his favor. 
Sometimes, a group of concubines might take matters into their own hands and attack a concubine so as to ruin her beauty, which will inevitably get her kicked out of the courtyard because of the fact that she has lost her beauty. They were well fed. Unsurprisingly, the emperor's concubines ate the best of the best food items that China had to offer. The shocking part isn't the fact that they ate well, but it was the sheer amount of food they ate on a daily basis. Known to take all kinds of food from honey to magnolia, concubines received the freshest food stuff from all over China. Every day, the emperor's courtyard received imports of food from all across the land. This wide array of imports included sturgeons, pigs, honey, chicken, fish, etc. The daily meal of a concubine was undeniably impressive. The highest ranking concubines were each served 21 pounds of premium meat, 13 pounds of regular meat, one chicken, one duck, four liters of grain, 12 pounds of flour and sugar, two pounds of honey, one pound of dried fruits, 33 pounds of fresh vegetables, 66 pounds of milk, and 10 bags of tea per day. Yes, per day. And the lower the rank, the lesser the food given. As such, the lowest ranking concubines would only get 5 pounds of premium meat and 2 pounds of regular meat every day and 5 chickens per month. Still, nowhere near starvation. They were ranked according to importance. In most places you visit in the world, it is often common knowledge that every human is equal and no one person is greater or more important than the next. However, this was not the case in the courtyards of Imperial China. Depending on how important a concubine was to the emperor, she was ranked accordingly. Those who bore the emperor a son would obviously rank higher than those who bore him daughters, and those who could not bear him a child at all. The higher the ranking of a concubine, the more benefits she had to enjoy. More maids, more food, more privacy, more gifts, and of course, more power in the courtyard. A concubine who played her cards right could not only elevate to the highest rank possible for a concubine, but could also stand a chance to replace the emperor's wife to become an empress and help govern all of China. As in ancient China, the emperor was seen as the heavens, while the wife was seen as the earth. So as the people looked unto the heavens as their father, they were taken care of by the earth who was their mother. This, however, was no easy task to accomplish, as a large amount of luck also had to be on the side of the concubine who wanted this, and climbing up the ranks was more difficult than anyone could imagine. In the Qing Dynasty, Emperor Kangxi, who ruled from 1661 to 1772, famously had a ranking system for the women in his courtyard, which included eight steps. If the emperor dies, they die. Concubine in Chinese roughly translates to slave. It comes as no surprise why they are treated in the manner which they are. They are basically treated as privileged slaves, and this doesn't end even after the emperor is dead. Records of ancient Chinese history and culture has showed that, even after the death of an emperor, his concubines are not set free. In fact, it becomes worse. When the emperor dies, his concubines are killed too, so that the emperor would not be lonely in the afterlife in the belief that he will be accompanied by his numerous concubines. This is not the fate of all concubines of emperors, however. A lighter and more common scenario after the death of an emperor is that his concubines are all taken to the monastery where they will live out the rest of their lives as monks, never to marry anyone ever again.
With all that has been said, what do you think about the concubines of ancient China now? Which fact was the most shocking to you? Would you have loved to be a concubine in ancient China? Tell me your answers down in the comment section. Hope you enjoyed the video, and if you did, don't forget to like and subscribe. Also, hit the bell as well so you don't miss any videos, because we have a lot more interesting things to come. See you soon.